Um, good morning, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Lunch, Leading and Learning with the Office of School Improvement. We are so excited to have you here this morning. Some of you may not know me, so let me take a moment just to introduce myself. I am Dr. Lawanda Mitchell. I am new to the Office of School Improvement. Um, I'm originally from Alabama, but have spent the last 10 years leading and serving and school districts throughout the state of Indiana. So I am excited to join my fearless leader, Dr. Melissa Shields and our team here today. So thank you for having me and let's jump in. We are here today because we are talking about some ASIP guidance. Something with wicked comes this way, not really, not really. So let us help you face the fear of the ASIP. Okay, so here we go. For those of you who would like to follow along, you can find our bit.ly link to follow on this particular slide. We'll give you a few minutes to go ahead and get that information. While we're waiting, those of you who would like to also connect with us on Twitter, you can follow us on our Office of in School Improvement Twitter page, as well as our personal pages, Mr. Jones, as well as Dr. Mitchell. If you decide to tweet out anything today, please use our hashtags of something wicked. Can everybody see this information? So again, feel free to follow us on Twitter at Alabama State Department of Education, OSI, WK Jones 89 and Lawanda Mitch 85. Awesome, thank you, Ryan, glad you can see everything just fine. Awesome, awesome. We'll give you a few more minutes to get that information. You can find our presentation there if you would like to follow along. And again, feel free to tweet it out. Let the world know that the state of Alabama, we're doing lunch leading and learning together and we are really here to support the students across the state of Alabama. Feel free to use the hashtag better together as well. We are really gonna kick this thing off. For those of you who would like to receive a credit hour in PowerSchool, please register. We will provide the link in the chat as well. Look for the title, Something Wicked This Way Comes, not let us help you face your fear of the ASIP. Again, the link can be found in the chat. So if you're looking to receive credit for today's session, please feel free to register in PowerSchool. Hopefully you have this information again. Make sure you check that chat to find the link. All right, you guys. So here is our awesome team. So this is the office of school and improvement. Do. I'm gonna mute we you. are here I'm to mute. serve your needs. We are all literally servant leaders. So some of those faces may look familiar. In the end, I'm going to give you our contact information as well. So feel free to follow us on Twitter to get our contact information and reach out whenever your school district needs support. Many of our team members have joined us online today. So you'll notice the OSI background um, on their pages as well. Some of them are out in the field working, servicing some schools and some districts at the present moment. So again, look out for our team. We are excited to be here. Okay, so before we dive in, let's just take a moment to simply reflect, okay? So when you start hearing the topic of ASIP guidance, what scares you when reflecting on completing the ASIP? What were some of those initial thoughts when we say it, it is time to complete your ASIP? What does it mean for an ASIP to be complete? So we're gonna get into some of that discussion following um, today's presentation. Just take a moment to think on it and then we're gonna jump in. One more thing, here's the thing about the ASIP. So this is why we wanted you to kind of reflect over this question. Um, we've noticed that a lot of people kind of see the ASIP as this big monster 
of a topic to do something huge to cover. So a lot of people kind of fear that where our goal and our job today is to hopefully take away some of that fear, to ease some of that anxiety that you might have around completing your ASIP for your school. And always remember, you have the OSI team to help you make sure that you accomplish this work. We don't want this work to just sit on the shelf and no one looks at it later on. We want it to be a living, breathing document that shows the actionable steps that your school is taking. And we are here to make sure that you have some support and some guidance throughout that journey. All right, so let's let's dive on in. We will, um, the, the question that Dr. Mitchell just posed to you about um, what does it mean to, for an ACIP to be complete? Uh, we get that question a good bit because you know the deadline is fast approaching. And so folks wanna know, well, what all do I have to have done in terms of strategies in uh, Cognia? And so we created this, diagram that you see on the screen, which is the, the inverted pyramid that sort of talks about the required pieces in strategy, what we expect to see done um, by October 17th in strategies. And so you'll see there are lots of other features in the platform, but for us, these are the primary components that should be addressed in your school's ACIP. Um, and we'll talk through these as we move through um, this morning, but just wanted to, to have you Take a look at this graphic. If you want to take a screenshot or you want to just uh, right click and save or whatever you'd like to do or um, start or, or whatever, um, this is, um, we find this is very helpful for a lot of folks. So you might want to just um, stick it away somewhere so you'll have it. We also have um, some descriptions over on the right hand side of the different components. So you'll see those as well. And then we'll just move on to our next section. So when we talk about the ACIP and what has to be done, there are um, about seven components. So you see the seven components from the previous, uh, the triangle. Um, those seven components are spread out over three areas, three phases. And you, phase one is reviewing your data, the envisioning phase, uh, phase two is creating your plan, which is the planning phase in Cognia. And phase three is setting benchmarks or implementing, um, which includes our progress, our monitoring, um, and making adjustments as needed. So when we think about phase one, reviewing the data, um, that typically all of that happens in the envisioning phase of the Cognia platform. So you'll see on the left-hand side, there are a couple of, um, we get lots of questions about these three things, determine current reality, exploring the future, and synthesizing results. Lots of questions about, well, do we have to complete this? What parts of this do we have to get done? So the determine current reality piece is strictly up to your, it is your decision whether or not you're going to upload data to that portion of the platform. Um, we always recommend that you upload the data that caused you or it, that is resulting in what you're wanting to do in your ACIP, what you think is driving the decisions that you're making. We always encourage folks to put that there. However, it is up to you whether or not you're gonna add data in that specific portion of the platform. Um, get lots of questions about, well, if my needs assessment is done, can I just upload my needs assessment there? Yes, you can attach your needs assessment there in that, um, kind of addresses your current reality because you've already had those conversations. Exploring the future is an interesting piece of the platform um, that we get several questions about because it doesn't always make sense. Exploring the future is a piece of the platform that Cognia added so that when we think about determine current reality, it's really what's happening in my building and what's happening in my community, whereas exploring the future is what's happening um, outside of my building, maybe outside of my community. So we upload things and explore the future that are trends or um, up and coming things that are happening in education or around the world. Uh, there's a political section there and, and we get questions, well, what would we put there? Um, here in Alabama, the legislature makes decisions about things that happen in our schools all the time. And so you could simply add 
um, an article about the Numeracy Act or the Literacy Act or the new um, additions to what it means to be college and career ready. Any of those things would be external things that are impacting what's happening in your building and would satisfy the exploring the future component. But again, exploring the future is something that's completely up to you whether or not you want to utilize that portion of the platform. And finally, the third thing on that side of the screen is the synthesized results. And this is where your priority statement and your strategic themes, that's where they're housed. And so that is the one portion of the envisioning phase that you do have to complete is the synthesized results portion. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, more about that in just a second. So when we're talking about the, uh, the initial review of data in phase one, that generally the best way to start or the place, best place that we have found to start um, these conversations is around an educational garage sale. So we use a garage sale protocol um, some of our schools will use this at the end of the year to close out their ACIPs. Some folks will use it at the beginning to kind of have a discussion around the previous year's ACIP and what they want to take with them into the new plan. So the garage sale has you list all of your practices, ceremonies, and policies in your school. So it was your activities in your previous plan. Um, sometimes we have schools include critical initiatives, and that's totally okay as well. And then you have a discussion around what should be archived, what should be kept, what should be repaired or discarded. And then you follow through with that. And so the categories we use for the garage sale are the museum, not for sale, the repair shop, the garbage and toxic waste. Um, and so museum, quickly run through these five things. The museum are the practices and our activities that worked well for us, but we don't have a need for them moving forward. That could be something as we've had schools that hired, um, let's say a graduation coach and the graduation coach was listed in the plan. Well, graduation rate is up. Um, those skills that the graduation coach was building across the, the building, they're certainly ingrained in our daily practices. And maybe we, don't, we no longer may need a grad coach. We may need to divert those funds somewhere else. Well, the grad coach did exactly what we needed that person to do for, the time, for that time and so that would be a museum item because it served us well, but we're not going to continue doing that moving forward. Um, not for sale is the easy category. It is what's in your previous plan that you want to carry with you into the new plan, and you do not plan to make any edits or adjustments. It worked perfect for you last year, and we want to do it exactly the same way. The repair shop are the things in your old plan from last year that worked well, but you or some folks on your leadership team, you all feel like it could be better. Um, it's just not quite what we want it to be. Um, we see this sometimes around intervention. It doesn't seem that we're, and I love this, but it never, it never seems that we're always quite happy with the way we do intervention. And so a lot of times we see how we carry out intervention, the services we provide, what time we're doing that, the bell schedule around providing intervention. Those are things I see show up in the repair shop all the time. Um, and those are things that, yeah, we're going to continue to do that. We, we did okay with it last year, but we feel like it could be better. Um, garbage is exactly what it means. It is the things that were in our plan from last year. Just didn't work for us. Uh, and we're just going to chunk that. Um, it may have worked for somebody else down the road, but in our building, for our people, just didn't work. And then another would be toxic waste, the fifth category, which I don't always see toxic waste used, which is a great thing, um, but it is the, uh, the fifth category that could be utilized in this um, protocol. And toxic waste is used when an activity or something that was implemented in your school, not only did it not work, but it also was maybe counterproductive to the goal. So it didn't move us forward. It didn't leave us where we were. It actually took us back. And that is something we want to make note of. We want to file it away as toxic waste. So it's never utilized again. That We've learned our lesson and that will never happen again in our building. So in the presenter notes of uh, this slide, and I, I believe Dr. Mitchell has put it in the chat, what we did is um, we have a separate presentation that we use when we carry out this protocol with a, a leadership team or with a, a school staff. And so I want you to have that presentation in case you wanted to carry out this activity uh, with a group of folks in your building. 
And that just takes each one of these sorting categories and it, it um, gives a slide per one. So you could talk about each one to the group um, and then prepares them to do the garage sale activity. So some other data points. So we go from the garage sale, we kind of trim down what we want to take with us, what we want to leave behind from last year. And then we start really diving into, okay, what else do we need to know? How do we measure how successful last year was? How do we look ahead to see where we might have some needs that we didn't address in our plan previously, but we want to address moving forward? So some data points that we encourage you all to look at. Um, you can see on the screen, we'll talk about all of those. But looking through, so often we see that the only data points that sometimes our schools will gravitate to are our standardized test, ACAP, ACT, uh, those big chunks of data, whereas there are lots of other pieces that inform our plan. There are lots of other places to find data um, or pull data from that can inform what we should be doing in our buildings. So you'll see um, learners and parents, and those include your Title I surveys, your other, the surveys that you administer throughout the year um, in, in other ways, um, your support systems, graduation rates, CCR rate, those things should also be considered. Um, if you're a high school, your discipline, you should be looking at yearly discipline trends, yearly discipline, um, those number of infractions, um, looking at attendance data, um, what you're going to do around that, education professionals as well, that category looking at teacher effectiveness. You can look at that through the lens of the, those overall aggregate Elliott data um, that you have access to if you use the Elliott tool. Um, this coming year, you'll have access to the ATOC data. And so that aggregate data will also moving forward beyond this school year once we have it, will also infer, inform the overall success of our plans. And then climate, culture, community engagement, all those things are also pieces of data that you can look at in uh, preparing to write a new plan for this school year. Uh, the graphic on the screen gives some other data sources. This graphic was created by a former team member of ours that has since retired, Meg Lowry. Um, and this, this graphic was created specifically during the pandemic when we didn't have some of the same data sources that we were accustomed to. And so all this did was kind of give us another um, kind of a graphic to say, okay, well, if I don't have ACAP and I don't have ACT, then what do I have? Well, now we have ACAP, we have ACT, but we also still need to be looking at some of these other data sources. So this graphic is great to kind of give us some other ideas of places we want to pull um, student and, and community data from. So when we talk about data, we should be asking some critical questions. Where are we now? That sort of addresses that current reality thing that I mentioned earlier. And then looking at where do we want to be? From where we are, what is our goal? What's our end goal? What do we hope for um, in our building for our students individually and collectively? And then looking at how we're going to get there, as well as how we're going to monitor that progress. What moments along the way, what checkpoints are we putting in place that we can monitor if we're moving in the correct direction? And then how will we evaluate our effectiveness? Sometimes we, we end up where we want to be but we don't have systems in place to measure if we were effective in our process. So these are questions that we should be asking and thinking about as we um, consider data and the, the things that surround data. So you have to identify key data measures as part of this process. Um, and so when we look at key data measures, we look at not only just test scores, as I mentioned, um, but looking at all the other pieces that impact what happens in our buildings. We also focus on growth. You'll see bullet three says student achievement is a result of multiple factors. So let's focus on growth and looking at a holistic view and different types of data should be collected to inform the improvement process. We all say that, but oftentimes, again, we limit ourselves uh, to just a handful of things instead of looking at pieces of data that can inform the entire picture. So when you're having data conversations, some things that we wanted you to keep in mind. Oftentimes what we see, and I'll point out a couple, um, is I, I see uh, bullet three um, happen a good bit where we cling to the outcomes of a handful of kids or the outlier, outlier bias is really what that is. It's the idea that something um, that maybe we're passionate about and we feel like this has to be a part of our plan 
but yet our data is saying something else. But if it worked for one kid or two kids, sometimes we cling to that and say, well, it worked for these two or these three. I know it can work for everyone. Um, our conversations around the ACEP have to be truthful. And so if something's not working um, as it should, I need you to have those, um, as Dr. Mitchell will say, those courageous conversations. Sometimes at the district level, um, we see this when a, a, a tool or a platform or a program is purchased for, let's say a district has eight schools, it's purchased for all eight schools. Well, then we look at the data and it's only working in, on one campus, but yet we continue to it force or require all eight schools to implement this program, although it's clear that it's only working in one campus. So for my district folks, I need you looking at outlier data from that um, perspective. And then in your building, I also need you having truthful conversations about whether or not something's really working. Selection bias or bullet two is what I also see sometimes in data conversations around the ACIP. Um, because sometimes um, we work on our ACIP from the, with the end in mind. We say, hey, I want to, um, I want our ACIP to focus on this particular piece, or I want, we, we know we want to purchase this, this program. And so we write our ACIP backwards. Your outcome becomes what drives everything else. And so when you start talking about data, then all of a sudden you're looking for data to justify the program that you decided you wanted to buy. And that is the opposite of the way the process should work. I need you to lay all the data out on the table from all those sources that we talked about and then prioritize based around the needs that you see from every data source that you collect in your building. And so all of these could show up. Bullet two and bullet three are oftentimes the ones that we see the most of. So data conversations. The other thing about this, and when you're talking about data with your leadership team or your faculty in preparation for the ACIP, data conversations are, should always be, I'll focus on bullet four specifically, about improvement and not accountability. Talking about data as it relates to the ACIP is not your chance to finger point. As a building, as a team, as a district, we're not assigning blame based around the data that's laid before us. Is there a time for an accountability data conversation? Absolutely. But that's had with a principal and a specific teacher, or that's had with a district and a specific leader. But what we're not doing in conversations about data as it relates to the ACIP is saying, oh, you know, this is, the data is like this because this was the ninth grade teacher's fault, or this was the middle school's fault, or this was the elementary school's fault. We're not assigning fault or blame in a conversation about data as it relates to the ACIP at any point. The goal here is that the data lays the starting point. We establish the current reality or the starting point. And then we, from there, we start developing a plan moving forward. And so that's really important that our data conversations don't get caught up in what was or what should have happened, but really are geared towards what can and what are the possibilities. So when, the next phase is going to be create your plan. So once you've created your current, you've established your current reality, you've created your, um, you kind of dove into your data, you can see where your priorities need to be, then we start really crafting that plan. And I'm bouncing around a little bit, um, but the planning phase is primarily held within what you see, the planning phase in the cognitive platform. That's objectives, critical initiatives, outcomes, key measures, um, and a little bit of the piece before, which was the priority statements um, and synthesizing those results. So let's dive into that a little bit more. So we had some questions um, in the registration form that you all filled out, the Google Doc, about, well, how do I know the difference or what's the difference between um, a goal, an objective, a critical initiative, or an activity? Well, one being, uh, I can answer the one about goals first. Goals is not a term used in cognitive. So if you're going to use the term goal, then it might be, um, I would say an objective is a three to five year goal. A critical initiative is a one year goal. Um, so goal could be used as sort of an adjective, I guess, or um, an inter uh, a 
a synonym for a couple of things in the plan, but in actual cognia, we, we don't use the word goal. So that's number one. Um, two, an objective. An objective lasts us three to five years. It is a statement that is so broad that it can serve me for multiple years. So I'm not getting into any, really any specifics. I'm just saying we want to work on academics or, or our goal is to, to, to uh, change how we utilize instructional technology. We are setting something that we are not going to achieve in a one-year time period. We, it's going to take us multiple years to achieve this objective. So an objective serves us three to five years. And then a critical initiative, which was one of the other things that was mentioned in the form, that is something that lasts us one year. We emphasize the word critical. It is written in a way that we can address this or we want to address this specific thing in one academic year. And then finally, activities. Activities are the actual, what is happening in the classroom or in the building on a daily or a weekly or a monthly basis is what we're actually doing to achieve the critical initiative or to address the critical initiative. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but so priority statements and strategic themes, that's sort of the top end of the pyramid, um, of the triangle. Um, priority statements, you can see they are developed by looking at your data. We look at the data and we say, okay, these are the areas that we've got to focus on whether those be achievement or student supports, we've got to focus on building professional capacity, whatever those may be, it's what our data is saying are our priorities. And the strategic themes are developed as a result of those priority statements. So they can define a gap in the current reality and desired performance. They synthesize a lot of those conversations that you're having around the data. What a lot of our districts use, well, some of our districts will use the, the, strat the strategic themes that you see on the screen. Um, they like some of the ones that we've provided as examples because they serve as very broad strokes that a lot of the things you're doing at the district level can be placed underneath these broad headers. The other thing that we see districts do, which we totally understand and agree with, is many times the district already has a strategic theme, a strategic plan, I should say, that has four to five pillars, four to five objectives or goals for the district. And so there is nothing wrong with taking those same overarching ideas from your district strategic plan and using those as the strategic themes within your building-based ACIP. Um, we actually think that that's a great idea. Um, for schools to, to utilize what the district has already done in terms of the work around building that strategic plan, because many of those plans were developed through town hall meetings or community meetings or parent uh, PTSO or whatever that may look like. So you've already heard from your stakeholders. You, the district looked at data in developing those, so it should align. And then from there, once you've decided or adopted those district strategic themes, um, then you start aligning what needs to happen in your building underneath those things. Uh, I certainly recommend this to districts that are going through or have an upcoming engagement review with Cognia for reaccreditation. Uh, it, uh, it eliminates any question about whether or not your building-based plan is aligned with the overall strategic plan for the district. Um, in our language, it matches in that regard. Um, what you don't want to do is have the district have a set of strategic kind of goals, overarching pillars, if you will, that then your plan looks totally different or you're using different language. And so the engagement team that's coming in to look at reaccreditation is having to kind of fill in the gaps with how what you're doing in your building aligns with what's, what's decided at the district as a focus. Um, so certainly we agree with schools that adopt their district pillars or goals and put those into their building-based plans. So strategic themes lead to continuous improvement. So they should be clearly defined. Um, it should be prior to prioritized based on importance, which we've said. They should be few in number. You should not have more than five strategic themes. It just shouldn't happen. Um, they should be ambitious but achievable. 
um, increase should focus on increasing student learning and changing um, adult practice. And then finally, should address all students, not just at risk or subgroups. Some things that we see and and that I want to be clear about is we had ATS high school specifically or schools, maybe even a carryover from the old assist verbiage um, where schools felt a need to specifically address a subgroup or uh, address their at-risk or what was called the at-risk population, whatever that may be. Um, while that should be happening for an ATSI plan, you should be talking about the subgroup in the plan, how you're going to address that, that need that is not, that does not mean that it should be an overarching strategic thing. I should not pull an ACIP and see special education as a strategic theme. Um, I should not see any of the other subgroups that may have landed a school on the ATSI list. I shouldn't see those explicitly listed as an overarching theme. Um, what we encourage schools to do is if you are, or you you're at the district and you're serving ATSI schools, or if you are a school that is ATSI, that underneath your, your overarching goals, that you build maybe a critical initiative that deals with a subgroup. Because what's happening is what, what the instruction that's being offered to, let's say special ed, we'll use that example because that's primarily what a large number of our ATSI schools are, were identified ATSI for special education you're addressing special education in core instruction. You're addressing special education in your support services in tier two and tier three. So why not in, embed what you're doing for that population in those specific places in your plan instead of reiterating all those things in a separate theme that you've set aside just for that one group? So it's really looking at your, your big themes and saying, okay, if I am ATSI and I do have to talk about a specific subgroup in my plan, well, if I have a theme, looking back at some of these, let's say I'm looking at example one, learning supports. Well, then if that's my overarching theme, then somewhere under that, I'm thinking about the learning supports that I provide for special ed. And then two, if I'm looking at literacy, then underneath that, I'm thinking, what am I doing about special ed specific to literacy? Three, math. What am I doing for special ed specific to math? And those things are embedded in the overarching themes of our plan instead of being what sometimes we may see is you may have a school that says learning supports, literacy, math, and then they'll have a four that's special education. And that, that's just really not what we recommend. So looking at critical initiatives and activities. So critical initiatives detail a relevant need and guide the implementation of activities. It is this is what I plan to address this academic year. And then activities are action-oriented, measurable, specific, and evidence-based. Um, they are the, the steps that you're going to take to, to um, address the critical initiative, um, whether that's what teachers are doing, whether that's what the principal's doing, whether that's what the instructional coach is doing or the librarian or whoever it may be. It is the specific things that those individuals are carrying out. Uh, it does require evidence. Um, and it should involve more than just math and language arts teachers. So the other thing we ask schools to think about at this portion of the planning phase is as you're thinking about what we want to add to our ACIP, is what you're thinking about, is it evidence-based, is, is it an evidence-based practice or program? Um, and we say that because if you're going to use title funds, you're going to use CSI funds, if you're going to use federal funds, um, which could be categorized in multiple ways. If you're going to use um, federal funds in a way, in any kind of way, we really want that to be, um, the requirement is, I shouldn't say we want, the requirement is that it be an evidence-based practice or program. So that if we were to review the ACIP or some, someone else were to kind of dive into what you were offering in your building, then we'd want to make sure that the things that we're putting in our ACIP are evidence-based practices or programs. So how do you check that? Um, a couple of resources that we provided or that we recommend um, are located on this screen. Um, we love What Works Clearinghouse. You can go to What Works Clearinghouse and you can say, okay, let's say that as a team, we met our team, we've got to do something different mathematics. Our data says we've got to work on mathematics. 
So we're going to build some activities in our plan that are focused on math. Well, let's talk about what is evidence-based practices and programs. So then as a team, we might go to What Works Clearinghouse, click on mathematics, and start exploring some of the things that we know to be evidence-based practices in mathematics that result in student achievement. Not just things that as a team, we're like, oh, well, let's do this, this might work. Um, when it comes to federal dollars, might is not an, an adequate answer. If something might work, that's not an adequate answer to say we're gonna spend funds on it. And it's not, it's certainly not something that I would jump to put in my plan, whether or not I'm spending money on it. Um, I'm all about trial and error. That's part of the improvement process. But I also think that you've got to do your due diligence in seeing if, if somebody else out here has tried what you're thinking and it didn't work, then maybe we need to move to the next idea. So what works is a great place to start to kind of test out or look through some things that we, um, there's some research out there that says, yes, this is working or no, this doesn't work. Um, evidence for ESSA is another great resource. Um, evidence for ESSA is really more on the evidence-based program side than I would say practices side, right? So this is where, let's say you're considering purchasing something with your CSI funds or you're purchasing something with, if you get CSI funds or with your Title I funds, um, then I might go here and search that specific program, um, that provider, and just see what evidence is out there that um, confirms Many of you probably are thinking about buying something because maybe you met a salesperson at Mega or you met someone at class and, and you have to go here. This is a great place to go to say, okay, I met this person. They claimed what they, they were selling works, but let's see if it really works and see what research is out there to support the claims um, that some of these companies are, are making. Um, and then on the right-hand side, you'll see a document that Dr. Shields on our team has put together um, I've added a couple of things, but she really did all the, the heavy lifting on this document. But it's just some additional guidance around evidence, best practices, and programs. So some additional websites beyond what works and evidence for ESSA, some other things that I would recommend are listed there as hyperlinks. And then it dives into kind of the description of what is evidence-based, what you should be, use, should be doing to vet the programs and practices, so we just want you to kind of tuck this away, start it, and make sure that as you're planning for your ACIP and what you're going to add to your ACIP, that we're, we're verifying that the things we want to do, there's evidence out there to suggest that it actually does work. So let's, let's walk from the top down. What, what is a theme? So let's say, a, let's say this as a school, my theme is student learning. Then an objective under student learning might be increased academic achievement and growth. That's a very broad statement. Remember, an objective has to last me for three to five years. So I, I think increased academic achievement and growth is going to last me for three to five years, right? As a school, we decided that at, for this particular year, our focus in achieving that objective, what, we're, what we want to do, our critical initiative is the implementation of high impact instructional strategies. So that is something that we're going to be very intentional about in this particular year in the example that's on the screen. And then from there, well, what, is, what are we going to actually do? What are the steps we're going to take? Then you can see the following is the activity. It's the hire the interventionist for the small group instruction. I'll make a note here that sometimes we see, let me say it this way. When, we, when I'm looking at the ACIP, I should not see um, in a school's ACIP that you have hired someone or that you have bought something specifically. I should not see a program name, a company name, or I should not see that you've hired someone until the activity level of the ACIP. And that's for several reasons, um, but the activity level is where we get very specific. So let's say you're going to go with Reading Horizons, or you're going to um, you're going to purchase iReady as your progress monitoring. That's great. You can add those things into your plan, but I should not see the actual name Reading Horizons or iReady until the activity level. Prior to that, everything is very much open ended and very much broad. Um, 
the the nice piece of this is what I also say the the not the purpose for doing that, but one of the side effects of doing it that way. As you all know, um, a lot of folks will um, print the strategy map and or they will post the strategy map portion of the plan to their school website. If I have left off hiring someone or buying a certain program to the activity level, then when I post my strategy map to the website, I've not told anyone out there that might happen upon my strategy map too much information. Um, they may know I'm planning to buy something, but they don't know what I've bought. They may know that I'm thinking about, um, in this case, implementing high impact instructional strategy, but they don't know that I'm going to be hiring someone. So it's a great way to limit the information that's public out of your plan is by pushing some of those real specific things down to the activity level. You'll then see financial resources, interventionist salary, those sorts of things. And then activity measure would be common assessment, progress monitoring, or observations. Let me make a note here too. Those three things are listed there as an example. But if I were actually putting this in my plan, I would only list one activity measure per activity. I would I do that because it creates more work for you. When we start thinking about evidence for, let's say, an engagement review or evidence for if, if you're being monitored for some reason, whatever that may look like, every time you list something, that's a piece of data or a piece of evidence that could be asked for. So when you start listing three or four things for each activity, that's three or four things you have to provide if asked for. So what I always recommend is an activity measure be limited to, to one. How are you going to know if it was done or not? That's all I need to know. In this case, hire the interventionist. That was the activity. Well, technically, all I need to know that that, that has happened is maybe timesheets. So I may list my activity measures timesheets, and that be it. And if someone asks me for evidence related to this activity, all I have to provide is the timesheet. I don't have three or four things that I got to go find to provide for evidence. So keep that in mind. Don't create too much work for yourself just because you want to create a robust activity. No need for that. So here's another example um, that kind of follows school culture, social worker, that sort of thing. Similar situation. Um, won't spend too much time here. So we had lots of questions um, from the registration form about monitoring your plan. Well, some of that wasn't our initial intent for this presentation. So if you want to stick around for and ask me a couple of questions afterward, you can. Um, but we included monitor your plan because the first piece under the implementing phase, the design implementation plan, um, is actually where you add activities. So it is, you'll notice on the left-hand side, the, the design implementation plan, that is the piece where you're adding those specific activities that are happening day to day, week to week, month to month, whatever they might be. This is also the last step that has to be completed prior to October 17th. So anything from this portion down on the left-hand side in Cognia, we're not, that isn't due by October 17th. So you've just got to get to the design implementation plan by the 17th. But looking at the overall year, and we get questions about, well, what should be happening? When should we do, be doing certain things? So this is sort of our suggestion. Isn't a right or a wrong? This is what we suggest. That June, July, August, and September, that that summer and beginning of the school year is your chance to pull that data together, to pull your leadership team together, to have the planning conversations, and to really nail down what you as a building are going to do to commit to um, the CIP. And then October, November, December, that's your chance to really just test it out. We are implementing full force what we put in our plans. We are collecting our data. We're taking some notes. We're keeping up with what's happening. We're making some kind of some, some 
maybe some suggestions around things that need to be changed. Then come January, February, March, January specifically, we should be having um, a mid-year review. Where are we in the process? Are we where we thought we should be in this, in the plan? Have we achieved what we needed to? Are the things that we said we were going to do, are those things actually working for us? Because if not, this is where we change it. January, that in that mid-year review process, we start editing the plan. And I know sometimes people think, well, I can't, I can't change my plan. Well, that's not true. Now, before you start changing what you spent money on, you got to take a pause and you need to re really think about that because that's a whole different ball game. But let's say I bought, uh, let's, we'll use Reading Horizons as an example because I mentioned it earlier. Bought Reading Horizons, implemented in September. We're using it in our, um, our teachers are using it uh, in their morning routines or something like that. Well, that's not working. Kids are missing it. Kids come in late, so they're missing it, or whatever it may be. Come January, I want to revamp that. Well, there's no problem with changing how it's implemented. Now, I can't at G in January say, okay, well, I no longer want Reading, reading Horizon. I'm going to buy something else. Now, that's a whole different process, right? But how I'm implementing what I've purchased, I can certainly make adjustments to that. Um, as needed. And that would be the recommendation. Do not carry something out that you wrote in August through May. If come November, December, it's obvious it's not working. The plan is supposed to be fluid. So make your adjustments as needed. And then finally, when we're in April and May, we're closing out our plans. We're reviewing, we're doing our end of the year processes, um, and we're taking those step by step. Um, our team, um, Dr. Shields and I both have created um, several presentations that walk through both the mid-year process and the end of the year process. So we've got a couple of questions about, well, what does that look like? Should I be adding a narrative? Um, that's totally up to you, what you do in the mid-year and end of the year process. But we have created some, some supports, some documents and some presentations that walk you through that process if you choose to do a mid-year and an end of the year, end of the year review process. So some other resources I wanted you to have. The template you see on your screen for progress monitoring is from the Cog is from Cognia. So um, Dr. Mitchell, I believe, is posting um, a Word document in the, it's a Google Doc, but it's a Word document you can download that can be edited. These are Cognia templates that, that, that they created to help you monitor or keep up with your plan throughout the year. So we wanted you to have those. You'll also see the three things that you see on the screen. Um, we have on the left hand side is the from federal programs. It's the necessary components that are required for schools receiving a Title I funds. So, you know, I've got to do this in strategies, I've got to do this in surveys, and I've got to complete this in diagnostic. On the right hand side, you'll see the rubrics that we created on our team, in our team. The top one being the rubric that we use for CSI schools. So if you are um, in a CSI school or you're an administrator or you're in a district person that has CSI schools, this is the rubric we use to um, review those plans. So it is the non-negotiables for a school that is CSI. So as you're writing those plans, the expectation is that you're able to address, to say yes um, to that in that rubric to all of those things have, having been, been done um, within the plan or being addressed in the plan. Primarily, the big thing that we expect to see in CSI schools um, is that all of the report card indicators be addressed. Um, so we're looking at attendance and achievement and growth. And at the high school level, we're looking at grad rate, CCR. Um, all of those things should be addressed explicitly in a CSI plan, uh, ASIP. Now, the bottom right-hand side looks at our ATSI and non-ATSI schools. So what what should be in those ACIPs? Look, using this document is a great document to use, especially if you're the district and you're looking at school plans, um, using this to kind of say, yeah, we've addressed this. No, we haven't. We might need to make some adjustments. Um, all three of these documents are hyperlinked here on this slide, and as well as um, you, those links will be provided to you. So I mentioned um, some of the resources that Dr. Shields and I had created around end of the year, mid-year processes. Um, I also, we had questions um, in the registration uh, form 
that ask about, well, how do I copy a plan over? Should we copy a plan over? Let's talk about that for just a second. Um, I would caution you in copying a full plan over from a previous year or previous years. Um, our ACIPs that were created or generated as a result of the pandemic, pandemic plans most likely are not applicable for what we're looking at right now. So I don't want you just hitting copy and then just taking everything as is. Um, when you go to copy and Cognia, you have the option to just copy strategic themes and um, those priority statements, or you can copy objectives. You can copy the whole thing, or you can copy just portions. So I would, I would encourage you to really think about, well, do we need to copy the entire document or our themes haven't changed. So we're just gonna copy our themes and then we'll edit from there. So being real strategic about that. I'm not sure, some of the questions I think were specific about the logistics of copying. Um, if you're in your plan and you do not have the copy option, that means that you are probably a, maybe just an editor in the plan and not an administrator in the plan. Um, so whoever has Cognia, um, whoever controls Cognia access for your school or your district might need to edit your user rights um, or else you might need to talk to someone at the district about hitting copy. Um, because depending on your user rights in Cognia, copying isn't an option for some of the, for some users. So that may have been where one of those questions came from. But the document you see linked here is where we put all of our ACIP stuff. You can see everything that we've created, all the things that Cognia has done for us, all of those resources um, from my mega presentations to my district presentations, all of that is there. And so um, we certainly recommend that you kind of open this document, save it, star it so that you can go back and access it. Hey, William, can I pop in there? Oh, yeah. Um, one of the things that um, we've been asked too is can folks just use the existing CIP and just rename it? So like, don't don't copy it. Just let you have last year's and you just put this year's date on it. Um, and you can do that. But one of the things we, we kind of caution you about is if you do that, you're kind of losing the integrity of the plan from the year before because then you start changing it. So it, it makes a little bit more sense to, if you want to make a copy, make a copy of it, and then you can still see what you had last year and have some comparison discussions, because we know that that is an option to just go into your existing plan and just edit what you've got and put new dates on it, but you will lose, you remember in the previous, what was that, ESIP, I'm trying to remember all the things we've had in the past, you would see so many iterations of your plan. So this gives you an opportunity to see the 21, 22, the 22, 23, mm -hmm. and so forth. Well, and that could also be problematic. Um, I don't like getting too much into the details of an engagement review, but it would also be problematic there because what you see on your school side is also what Cognia sees on their side. So they need to see an engagement review is every five to six years. Um, they need to see the, the plans that have been written in that time span. So if you go writing over existing plans, then your historical plan that the engagement review team are going to be looking at will not be there for them to review. So it could be problematic for your engagement review as well. So we certainly, yes, it's doable, but that, that I agree with Dr. Shields, that would not be a recommendation. So when we think about our, um, that sort of ends our presentation. I, I <laughs> promised you I would be a steward of your time. It is almost 12 o'clock, right at 12 o'clock. Um, we got a little bit of time. We're going to stick around. Um, so if you have questions, um, I know we have some very specific questions in the, uh, red, on the registration form. Um, and some of those were, um, uh, applicable to the presentation. Some were sort of secondary things that I could see why you have those questions, but may not be um, beneficial for everyone in the in the presentation or in, in the Zoom room. So you want to stick around and ask those, or if there's any questions that are for the good of the group, you can post those in the chat. I'll try to answer those um, right now. Um, if you've got a run and your time doesn't allow you to stay with us, um, I did want to point out that we have our OSI support form 
um, linked on the screen. Um, I think we're going to drop that in the chat as well. Um, if you can't stay with us and you still you want individual support, you can always fill out that form for any need you have. Dr. Shield get Dr. Shields gets that those responses and sort of from there kind of reaches out to us and says, "Hey, this is in your this is in your area or this is in your your wheelhouse. Can you help?" And um, we always try to prioritize those. So um, again, if you can't stay with us, that's that's one way you can get us. Um, I think I'm not sure if Dr. Mitchell if if she's with us, but I think absolutely. Um, can you hear me? Okay. I I'm can. Bring in that request form um, for those of you who are still with us. William, Mr. Jones just mentioned how you can get in contact with us. So there is the link to that form if you need to use it. And now comes your part um, for today's session. What we would love for you to do is to, one, give us your feedback because we love to hear from you. We really serve you. So we're looking for your questions, your concerns that we can assist you with. Additionally, this is how you get credit for attending today's session. So in order to get credit for today, make sure that you click on our reflection and attendance form. Mr. Jones has also placed it in your link um, so that we get a little bit more information about you, your concerns, and um, your attendance for today. Okay, we'll give you a few more minutes to click on that or to get that link. So again, we really want to hear from you. We serve you and your district. So let us know the needs that you have and we will do our very best to assist in any way that we can. Okay, again, here is our fabulous team across the state of Alabama. This is how you can get in contact with us. If you need to go ahead and take a picture if need be, this is our email addresses. You have Mr. Jones, Mr. William Jones. You have Mrs. Wendy Arnold. You have Dr. Marcy Burroughs. You have Mr. Anthony Buckner. You have Mrs. Tara Smith, Mrs. Robin Davis. You have Dr. Joseph Garner. You have Dr. Lawanda Mitchell. Hi, everybody. And then you have our fearless leader, Dr. Melissa Shields. So if you need us for anything under the sun, please do not hesitate to let us know. Again, take a picture if you need to. Um, I think we have a question in the chat box. Thank you, Dr. Shields. So again, contact us if you need us. You have our email addresses as well as the request form. Um, we try to make it as convenient as possible for you if you need to reach our office. You are more than welcome. Thank you for joining us. So you guys, I'm excited about this next session. Our next session, we already have it on the book. So go ahead and mark the date. October the 5th at 11 o'clock is our next um, lunch leading and learning session with the Dr. Karen Anderson and Mrs. Tara Smith, you do not want to miss this. So we have ways that you can go ahead and register now. Um, you can click on the link within this PowerPoint if you want to register there. We will also place the link um, in the chat box. So go ahead and get that on your calendar because it is going to be fantastic. Those of you who attended MEGA, you know what a treat we had. We've heard your feedback across the state. So again, you don't want to miss it, go ahead and get that on the calendar. I see the link is already in our chat, so we're looking forward to seeing you in that session as well. And again, uh, Mr. Jones and I and Dr. Shields, we just want to say thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us for lunch today as you are leading and learning together in your building. We hope that you take it back to your team um, and you contact us if you have any questions, any concerns. Again, here is our contact information. Uh, make sure you follow us on Twitter. Um, use those hashtags that we talked about earlier and really let them know across the state what you spent your time doing today so that you can better support your schools. Please find our phone number at 334-694-4979. Um, Dr. Shields, Mr. Jones, anything you want to add to the mix? 
was just going to say, this is a great time. We're not going anywhere, so we're going to stay on until all questions are asked. We want to give you our complete attention. And just like William said, we know sometimes like this is just a question I have, but I know this is something a hundred others may not have. So we'll be happy to kind of go through them because you might be surprised that others actually do have that same wonder. And so, um, yeah, please feel free to unmute yourself, um, post a link, uh, excuse me, post a question in the chat. William, I said we've already got one about um, making ASICs available in English and Spanish. We have so much, we've been in your spot. Um, many of you may be brand new to ACIP from the district level and here you are. I was that person and then like go forth and help 21 schools write great you know, CIPs. So we've tried to arm um, district folks and, and principals and leadership teams with as much information as we can. We hope you've enjoyed this kind of fun presentation. We thought this would be a great way for you to turn this around to your school in a very non-threatening ACIP, you know, kind of Halloween motif kind of way so that you can pick the slides that you find most impactful for your staff. Um, highly recommend the yard sale because we call it yard sale. I think we call it garage sale, but in Alabama, we call it yard sale. <laughs> um, but that is, we have had a lot of fun um, performing these yard sale protocols in the schools. So I highly recommend that. Um, we, I'm going to pass that back to you, but I'm going to be Manning the chat as well, if I need to throw any links in the slides. Is I'm going to stop recording. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? What is the in 